What then were the key drivers that were behind these results and can that profit growth be sustained? Yes, good morning. Uh, look, we had a very strong half. Uh, we were able to continue to operate and operate our businesses in a COVID safe manner and in Australia and New Zealand in particular, that meant that the supply chain for building and construction remained open. Uh, there's a lot of discretionary money being spent in the economies as well as some government stimulus and that manifested itself in really high levels of demand. Uh, we saw some improvements in our ASEAN network as well. It's been a little while for us to see demand pick up in the ASEAN businesses. A strong result in China, a strong result in India and the North American market after the initial disruptions from COVID with the closure of the automotive industry. That's rebounded very quickly back to levels that it was pre the COVID closures. You've talked, I know, about the, stop, the, the, the steel spreads being very tight, materially higher, of course, and that's been a benefit to the business. Does that, do you expect that to be sustained? There's a big focus now on this reflation trade. The spreads, of course, are part of that conversation. Yes, look, particularly in North America, steel prices are at record levels. We've never seen steel at $1,100, almost $1,200 a short tonne. So that's an extraordinary pricing level. Uh, I gave up trying to forecast steel pricing a long time ago because it's, uh, it's a zero-sum game. We've got a business that's got a low-cost position, which means we can take advantage of these times in the cycle where prices are high. But what I would say is I suspect the, our read of the supply chains in North America... Uh, there's no significant build-up in inventory. Demand has bounced back. Many businesses, I think, ran inventory levels down as we went into the very uncertain COVID period. And the bounce back in demand has stretched supply chains. So our read of, our read of it, quite frankly, is that supply chains are tight and that should keep pricing pressure in the markets for at least the next six months is our expectation. Uh, Mark, David here. I wanted to pick up then on financials, and I'm looking at some of your presentations here. This is quite a long PowerPoint, I have to say, though. <laughs> Free cash flow up $270 million. Uh, th That's quite a lot of cash you guys built up in the last six months or so. Uh, I think you went from 80 to 305. What do you plan to do with that money? Are you looking to maybe repay some of your debt? Are you looking to give some of that back to your shareholders? Talk to us about that, how that dovetails into your confidence of the outlook. Yeah, David, that's a good, a good question. We, we have a set of financial principles and one of those uh, that we adhere to and one of those is that we keep a strong balance sheet. Uh, right at the moment, we've got a very strong balance sheet with, as you point out, a net cash position of $305 million. So we actually don't have any debt to repay. Uh, but we're in the middle of the largest capital expansion that we've ever undertaken as a company. So we're spending $700 million US dollars, almost a billion Australian Aussie dollars, uh, on the expansion of our North Star steel mill in North America. Uh, we're into that project. We have about $600 million of Aussie, Aussie dollars to spend in the next 12 months. And right now, our cash balance and the strong balance sheet position we have means that we've effectively got the money to pay down that uh, capital expansion project, which will be a very attractive proposition for Blue Scope shareholders going forward. We're talking about another C next, climate, the sharpened focus that you guys have on climate change. And you're not just saying that. You guys have actually established a new role, a chief executive for climate. Um, I believe that's uh, Greta Stephens. Sounds good on paper. How does that sound good in practice, though, Mark? Yeah, look, a really exciting uh, change for us. Greta has been running our New Zealand business. She had a long career in the aluminium industry and joined us a few years ago. So she's a very accomplished executive, operational executive, a background in engineering, material sciences. Uh, she's got a passion for uh, technology and, and we see that parlaying into the climate change role very, very well. The steel industry has challenges around decarbonising. We're a hard to abate industry. Uh, we decided to elevate uh, the role to the executive leadership team and have someone focus solely on what the next technologies or opportunities are that are emerging globally uh, that we can take advantage of to further decarbonise uh, our steelmaking processes. So we don't have an answer yet, but by putting Greta in that role and building a team of subject matter experts around her, uh, we'll stay very close to the technologies that are being developed in places like Europe, where there's an enormous amount of pressure to decarbonise the steel route. 
Uh, and Mark, I know part of the focus for Greta and the team will be looking at green steel. Now, I, when I read green steel, I think of the, the, the fallacy of clean coal, uh, which is a myth. But green steel, explain to us why it is significant, why it shouldn't be put in the same basket as clean coal, and when is it going to become commercially viable? Yes, look, I mean, green steel is, it holds enormous promise. Uh, the steel industry is a hard-to-abate industry. 75% of global steel production comes from blast furnaces. We have a blast furnace at Port Kembla. Uh, the very chemical reaction of reducing coal and iron ore to steel means that you produce greenhouse gases or carbon. Uh, so there's no viable alternative at this stage. But there's very exciting work that's being undertaken in Europe and other parts of the world where hydrogen can be used as a replacement for coal. Uh, so this is, this, is the, uh, this is the focus that we're really going to put around Greta and her team, is what's emerging, what are the opportunities, uh, what are the challenges for something like building a hydrogen supply chain. But it does hold enormous promise. Uh, we have a reline that we're currently doing mm. some pre-feasibility work on, uh, likely to take effect from 2026 to 2030. My personal view is, I think, in the decade of the 2030s and beyond, we will see technologies that emerge that decarbonise steel making. And I think that's a very exciting opportunity for our industry.